welcome. This is a breakthrough moment because we're not here to talk about religion. We'll never agree on the differences of religion. In fact, if you're like me, you kind of like had enough. So I don't want to talk about religion. My name is Jose Rojas. We really do need a breakthrough for our personal lives. So we're going to talk about God, how to get to know Him personally as your Lord and Savior, experiencing the breakthrough together. It's not what you know, it's who you know. We're going to get to know Him better. It's a breakthrough. I want to welcome you back to another meeting in this series of breakthrough here in Tacoma, Washington. You know, the power of a breakthrough for your own life is that it's not a matter of debate. We've been seeing with each succeeding meeting that when you get to know the Lord Jesus Christ, it's not about opinion. It's not even about religion because he's the one who's religious about us. It's not what you know in the Bible, it's who you know, the author and the finisher of our faith. So we saw that there's power in this mind that God created. You have temporal lobes, you have a stem, but you have the power of the frontal lobe of your brain. Right here is where the reasoning occurs. This is where right and wrong, moral and immoral happens. That's why if you mess yourself up with, with addictions, you cloud your frontal lobe. And this is the only place where God can reach you. It's a powerful organ that God gave us right here. This computer nobody's been able to match. And so as he reaches you here, he says, come now, let us reason together, saith the Lord. Think about this. If your sins are as scarlet, they shall be white as snow. You messed up, I'll take care of it. Conscience destroys people. There are folks who can't, are, are like paralyzed because of their conscience. And the first great thing that God does when you experience him is that he forgives you of sin. That's powerful stuff. Because there are folks who have for years hoped that somebody can forgive them. We also saw that there's power in light. Light is so powerful you have radiation in it. It'll burn you if you don't have sunscreen. Light has electricity. If you go at the speed of light, you could actually transcend time. E equals MC squared. Give me a break. We suddenly all became physics people. Then we saw there was power in salt, how God transforms us. Like the salt awakens the flavor of food, so Jesus awakens the flavor of the gospel for us. And as salt uh, awakens a thirst for, 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 for water, so the salt of Jesus awakens a thirst for righteousness. I like that because salt also preserves, keeps things together. Salt also will melt the coldest ice. So see, when Jesus is present in our lives, he becomes our salt. He'll take care of it. And you could always spot a salty Christian because they salt everybody else. You see, now salt will hold back the bitterness of chocolate and accentuate the sweetness. So the salt of Jesus, when you experience him, he holds back the bitterness in your life and accentuates the sweetness of your journey. It can be good. It's an experience. All of this, you could debate it all you want, but until you experience Jesus, it's only talk. So last night... We looked at the Ten Commandments. Most folks, when they think of the Ten Commandments, they think of some list that was given to the Jewish people that no longer apply. But when we look at the first four commandments, don't have any other gods, you have me. Why, why, why would you want anybody else? Don't, don't, don't make statues. Why are you gonna pray to a rock or a piece of wood or clay? You can pray to me. You know, you know there are spouses who say, you don't need to look around. You have me. Don't raise your hand. Just your conscience. See, and, and, and God says, don't take my name in vain. We can respect each other. You don't have to mess with me. I don't have to mess with you. Then the fourth commandment, I have blessed Saturday. You and I can fellowship together. We can, like, hang out. See, all that 
is about love. I see no threats there. It's a definition of what love to God looks like. You respect him, you worship him, you honor him. You don't have to make statues. You don't have to take his name in vain. You can fellowship with him. Wow, I like those first four commandments. That's pretty cool stuff. And the last six commandments, honor your mother and your father. And Jesus pointed out, it's the one that has a promise that your days may be long upon the land which the Lord thy God gave you. And it also says, don't kill. I think that one's pretty obvious. Don't take another human life. Have you ever been shot at? I have. I'm happy to report they missed. <laughs> it's hard to hit a running target. Piece of advice, don't run in a straight line. That gives them plenty of time to aim. Run in a zigzag pattern. Most shooters on our streets are so busy looking cool, holding the gun sideways, we're not going to tell them how to hold it appropriately so they can aim right. We'll let them look cool and do this and miss us. Amen. Okay. See, so when you know that somebody wants to kill you, thou shalt not kill suddenly is a blessed commandment. Doesn't that make sense? Don't, don't kill. Don't take somebody else's spouse. Don't, don't commit adultery. Why would, you, why would you mess yourself up getting emotionally tangled with somebody who belongs to somebody else? Intimacy is so intense as God blessed it and created it that if you go out of marriage and do these things, you're going to hurt yourself. You're going to hurt each other. Innocent children on both sides. We're talking about please respect somebody else's spouse. Now, another one says, don't be a gossiper. See, don't speak what? False witness against your neighbor. Did you ever know that false witness is gossiping? Well, I reserve the right as long as I have a Bible verse to criticize somebody. Okay, so you only want to keep nine commandments. See, why would you want to destroy someone else's reputation? Uh, okay, there she comes. Don't look, don't look. There she comes. She thinks she's so good in those heels. I mean, I just... Don't look. Oh, oh hi, how are you? It's good to see you. And you were just dogging her. Don't, don't mess with other people. You know how your mama used to say, be nice. See, it's an easy commandment to understand. And, and then what's, what's the 10th commandment? Don't covet. You know what covet is? When you want somebody else's stuff. Another word to say it is jealousy. How come they have it? And I don't. People who get jealous finally just crumble into themselves. They become bitter. They become angry. Coveters are never satisfied if they get this computer. Well, when the new one comes out next month, how come he has the new one and I have the one that came out last month? See, you're never happy, and the Lord wants you to be happy. So if somebody else has good stuff, be happy for them. Don't make yourself miserable. So the first four commandments are about loving God. The last six commandments are about loving people made in the image of God. They're not a list of rules. They're a description of what one of God's people looks like. Now let me, let me nail this down in the name of Jesus. In the book of Matthew, chapter 22, Jesus is confronted by a lawyer. Now, that's pretty cool stuff. You know, the lawyers, they kind of like, they know the law. Uh, I'm stalling to give you a chance to find it. Those of you who watch on television, Matthew chapter 22. And uh, notice with me here the Word of God. Verse 35 and onward, it says, Then one of them, which was a lawyer asked him a question, tempting him, trying to catch him and saying something wrong. And he said, Master, which is the great commandment in the law? Kind of like, pick out one of the ten and tell me why it's your favorite. Knowing that the ten commandments go together. You don't just say, I like this one, but I don't like that one. So he's tempting him. This man's a lawyer. He knows what he's talking about. That's like pulling out legislation. Can you look at... Uh, chapter 2, can you look at subsection B, clause 3? 
And Jesus censors him saying, uh, in verse 37, You shall love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, and with all your mind. This is the first and great commandment. And the second is like unto it. Uh, what? I only asked you for one. Wait, wait. Second one's like it. Love your neighbor as you love yourself. And then these two commandments hang all of the law and the prophets. Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your soul, with all your mind. That's the first four commandments. That's all your heart. You know, when you give your heart to somebody, that's a lot to give away when you fall in love. With all your soul, with who, who you are, and with all your mind, with everything you believe. That's the first four commandments. Love the Lord your God. Jesus himself pointed out. The second is the last six commandments. Love somebody else like you love yourself. See, the Ten Commandments are a description of what love looks like. Ooh. You know that's good news. That's why it's called the gospel. The Ten Commandments can be a code to live by, not because you're supposed to, not because you have to. That's just what it looks like when you serve the Lord Jesus. You see, knowing Him for yourself is more than religion. It's hanging out with a religious God. And He blesses you. See, those Ten Commandments is what it looks like. If I was a doctor, I'd be telling you, this is the symptomology. Ooh. Now, I, I know I'm kind of, sort of, a little bit exciting. But you can't blame me. In our world in which we live, we need good news. Taxes. Uh, what else? The economy. What else? Jobs. What else? Health. What else? That car won't run. What else? Even the dog is limping. What happened this time? There's always something. We need good news. Don't we? Amen. See, that's why it is called the gospel. It's good news. The Ten Commandments were never intended by God to be bad news. And he told Israel, he says, so that you may know that I am your God and you are my people. Any questions? I love that, being one of his people. I grew up in L.A., you know. When you hang out on the street, you got people. You have your people. And then that other gang, they got their people. And then that crew, they got their people. And we start shooting each other's people. And as soon as this guy gets shot, well, we're going to go over there and shoot three of them. And, and usually it's the little six-year-old brother on the tricycle that got accidentally hit because people are hitting people. See... When you finally decide those are not my people, that's scary stuff. But the Lord wants us to know that he can be your God. And you can be one of his people. And if God be with us, who can be against us? Any questions? I once had somebody talk to me. They said, Pastor, after the program... I had to come and see you. I said, why? There was these two big guys standing behind you on the platform. Who were they? And I said, I didn't see anybody. Two guys, they stood there the whole time. You see, the Lord can have your back. I don't know what she saw, but somehow I thank God that night. The two big guys, of course, it's not hard to be bigger than me, but two big guys had my back. I thought it was just a sister who was very happy until I went over to Russia and somebody else said to me, who were those two big guys on the stage behind you? And I was kind of like, okay, now, I don't know about these two guys. So then when I went to Korea and held meetings in Seoul, I had a young lady come up to me, what's with the two big guys behind you on the stage? So somebody has my back. You see, when you are one of his people, you cannot describe this stuff. I've never publicly talked about this. The Lord will provide for you. Now, does that mean I'm spared the injustices of life? Does that mean the electric bill doesn't come to my house forever and ever? 
Amen? No, especially that 30-day notice still arrives and the, and the kid isn't feeling well and the car isn't starting, but the Lord is in my life. And he has my back. I may have to walk to work today, but he's with me. Ooh, I almost get excited. See, now Israel, God's people, suddenly got mad one day in Numbers chapter 21. Numbers chapter 21. They turned on the Lord and they went and told Moses, we don't want God. We want to go back to Egypt. We'd rather be slaves then eat this manna. Imagine God sent them bread from heaven. And instead of being grateful for this sweet bread that snowed on them every night, they would say, you know, it's like manna this and manna that and manna pancakes and roasted manna, boiled manna, <laughs> fried manna without ketchup, <laughs> banana bread. I mean... We, this thing got out of hand. We don't want his manna. We'd rather be slaves, it says, and eat steak back in Egypt. And God had always protected them with the presence of a pillar of cloud by day. And as the sun went down, that cloud would light up and it was a pillar of fire. And that's how God showed his people, I'm with you. I got you back. Like those two guys that I haven't yet gotten to see for myself see all of a sudden remember this God loves you so much that if you don't want him he will honor your request a kid once asked me I went on a college campus he was proud of himself because he would stump professors in philosophy class and finally he came to throw it at me and a group of kids came with him he says pastor yeah man Okay, God can do anything. Yeah, anything. God can do, I realized something was coming. Anything. God can do anything, right? Yeah, dude, yeah. Okay, one more time. I'll give you the last chance. God can do anything. Yeah. All right. Can God make a rock so big that he himself cannot move it? And I said, yeah, he made you. And the kid freaked out, oh, oh, uh, oh. You see, God made us. And if we don't want him to move us, he will honor our wishes and he won't move us. The easiest thing Jesus ever did was to open the eyes of a blind man. It was very easy for the creator of life to raise a dead person back to life. Is it hard for him who made all things to restore all things? If a lame man can walk, it's because he created him. But the hardest thing Jesus ever had to do was to reach the heart of a hardened person that doesn't want to be reached. You know what? I'm not into this, so like, bye. See, he will never force you. He will never force you. And that day, God's people said, we don't want him. We don't want his manna. We don't want his stuff. We don't want his little cloud thing going on here. And so God, in his sadness, realized he was kicked out. Have you ever been kicked out of something? Oh, I won't waste your time, but boy, have I been kicked out of places. And so the Lord stepped back sadly. His cloud moved back. But you know what lived in that desert where one million Israelis were living? It's called a sidewinding adder. Looks just like a sidewinding rattlesnake. It just doesn't have a rattle. And it's much bigger and fatter. Some of you know that I'm into venom toxicology. This snake, when it bites you, has what's called a neurotoxic property in its venom. And, and as soon as you are bitten, it gets into your bloodstream, it immediately begins to attack the brain stem. And right up into the section of the brain that controls your breathing, suddenly, poof, your lungs turn off. And without ventilator, you die. And I don't think they had a ventilator in the desert that day. 
They also have a hemotoxic property to the venom, which means it decoagulates blood, which means you start bleeding profusely. It thins the blood. It also has what's called a cytotoxic property in the venom, which means it attacks muscle tissue, which means it begins to kill the tissue. It's called necrosis. That means it's digesting it for the stomach on the outside of the snake when he eats. I'm sure you're interested in this. You're deeply moved. And then it has what's called a cardiotoxic property, which means it gets into your bloodstream, and when it gets to the heart, what happens? It's the end of a perfect day. <laughs> the sidewinding adders had been kept out by the presence of God. When these folks said, we don't want him, what did God do? He had to move back. And where did the snakes go? They went home, thank you. There's a million people there, though. So the snakes did what anybody else that sees things a hundred times bigger than them. They would bite in self-defense. Snakes only bite because they're scared to death. No, but he looked really angry. No, that is their expression. It's permanent. <laughs> Mama just had babies. She still looks at them. But it's not that she's mad. That's just, it's a fixed expression. That's just the way they look. And everybody kills snakes. Everybody. Admit it. If you see, don't, don't, tell, don't tell me because I can't take it. Everybody kills snakes. When I lived in Loma Linda, California, people would call me, I have a rattlesnake on my porch. Incredible joy, happiness forever and ever. Amen. I was able to do my lab work, venom analysis, comparisons, 34 different subspecies of rattlesnake in the United States to the day that I used to give in-services to doctors on patient management for snake bite. So it's for real. Don't look at me that way. So these snakes came home and they started biting everybody because they were scared and then they chop up the snake and then somebody else got bitten over there. And it says in the book of Numbers chapter 21, behold, many people began to die and a cry rose up in Israel. They came back to Moses uh, about what we said about God and manna. We take it back and <laughs> we're sorry. And it's, you can hear the screaming. Imagine a million people in panic what was happening on that desert now I have a question to ask you did God take the snakes away nope you just got to go find yourself a hoe or a shovel because God did not take them away God did the strangest thing he tells Moses all right I have heard their cry they didn't want me now they seem to want me back this is totally cool Go make a serpent out of brass and put it up on that high hill over there. From now on, whoever gets bitten, until they finish off with the last of the snakes who came home, whoever gets bitten, if they look at the brass snake, they will live. You see, what had happened is that Israel had stopped believing in God. When you stop believing, stuff gets out of hand. Now, here's what we mean by believe. No, I believe. No, no, it's never been a question. Hey, James says, you, th you say you believe in God? That's great, because even the demons believe. We're not talking about that kind of belief. No, no, dude, I believe, man. No, 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 we're not talking like that. It's like, are you married? Are you married? Okay, the big question is, do you believe in your marriage? Oh, well, uh, she and I haven't talked recently about it, but... Uh, oh, do you believe in your job? Well, I'm hoping to find something else. For, see, do you believe in something goes deeper, doesn't it? Do you feel it? Do you sense it? It's not just this esoteric, yeah, of course I believe in God. No, no, no. Do you believe in God? They had stopped believing. We don't want God. We don't want Moses, his servant. We don't want free food from heaven. We want to go back to Egypt and be slaves and eat steak. The things we give up for a good steak. I tell you, A1 sauce and mm -mm -mm, sauteed onions. Mm -mm. These guys were ready to give it all up for one dinner. It's amazing what we give up God for. And now God gave him a reason to believe. If you are bitten, if you believe me, look at the brass snake and you'll live. 
I can imagine some folks say, you know what, that is so illogical. I am not going to be such a fool as to look at a, a serpent on a, a, a made of brass. I mean, that's what's biting us. Why doesn't he make a lamb out of brass? Why doesn't he make an, uh, one of the other sacrificial animals? to the, for, No, no, no. He makes a snake. The very thing that's killing us, he wants us to look. And those people died. They rather debate. And that's what society today does. They prefer to debate religion than to believe in God. And those who believed, you, they're moving into their neurotoxic property. Their paralysis is moving up their legs. As it reaches the lungs, it's going to turn off. And, and uh, as they look, hey, I, I feel better. Instantly healed. Whoever looked got healed. If you believe. All things are possible to them that believe. And so now we have this situation. Moses has set up this thing, and anyone who looks at it, as I think belief spreads when you see others being blessed, and then now you got bit, you know what, I'm going to look. Others seem to have been healed. See, that's why we have meetings like this. As you see God blessing others, then maybe... He'll bless you too. See, when belief happens, when it's born in the hearts of men and women, then belief can spread. That's the salt effect that we looked at. That's how the light shines in darkness. You believe in something. Do you have something to believe in? Well, I remain neutral on religious matters. See, you don't want to believe in something. But you can believe. John chapter 3 Verse 14, Jesus is talking to the senior theologian in the Sanhedrin. This is a scholar. This man has two doctoral dissertations in theology. His name was Nicodemus. This brother knew the scriptures. He came to Jesus and says, what do I have to do to be saved? And he says, we have to be born again. Uh, how does an old man like me go back to my mama's body? And she ain't around anymore. And Jesus says, come on, you know what I'm talking about. You must be born of water and of the Spirit. Oh, baptism and receive the Holy Ghost. Yes, sir, that's what you need. But, 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 but. And then Jesus expands in verse 14. He says, as Moses was lift, had lifted up the serpent in the wilderness, even so the Son of Man must be lifted up. Said anyone who looks at him will not die, but have everlasting life. And the next verse says, For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten Son, that whoever believes will not die. They will have everlasting life. Because many have always said that is the most bizarre thing that Jesus would be crucified. After all, it was said by the apostles, cursed is he who hangs from a tree. To be crucified was the worst thing that ever happened. And Jesus was numbered among the wicked. All of our sins were placed upon him. He paid the price. You and I, the wages of sin is death. We were to die an eternal death. But he took our sins upon himself and as bizarre as that snake was on a pole it must have seemed bizarre that God's only son could be crucified on a pole and you see whoever looked at that brass serpent was saved whoever looks at Jesus and believes Amen. will be saved see it's simple this is not complex theology Although if we want to, the Lord is so wonderful, you can go into the soteriological implications of sanctification and justification by faith. You can develop a Christology from this message. But that's the science of Scripture. God loves that we can study the depths of Scripture, but He wants you to know that He put it simply so that all of us could understand it. There's no one who can say, okay, I, I don't get it. Yes, you do. <laughs> it's just, do you want to believe? Do you want to believe? Now, here's something that happened in Robstown, Texas. Robstown, Texas is way down 11 miles north of, of Corpus Christi. You, you figure out about where it is in the Gulf of Mexico? 
They have a high school there with one of the highest dropout rates at the time, many years ago, in the 70s. And uh, these kids did not believe in themselves. Uh, gangs and drugs was the biggest thing in this little tiny town where cotton is, was the only industry. So you have cotton gins, the most cotton gins in one town anywhere in America. And, and it's very, very flat land. It's the closest that you get to Saskatchewan in Canada. Very flat land. Where if a dog runs away from home, three days later you can still see him running away from home. <laughs> He's still leaving. Okay. Well, Rob's town is that flat. You just stand there and you get dizzy. This, this is seriously flat. I, last time I saw this was my kitchen table. And it's all cotton. So the baseball team at the high school is the Robstown Cotton Pickers. And they were in last place. So they were the brunt of all the jokes. The Cotton Pickers. <laughs> and everybody knew they were going to win. Poor Robstown Cotton Pickers. Wherever they went, they got picked. And they lost, and then to add salt to the wounds inappropriately, the inappropriate use of salt, they would egg the school bus as they would leave. So they lost the game, and now they had to wash the, the, the egg off before it wiped out the paint on their school bus. They were the laughing stock of the league. So one day the school wised up and released the coach and sent him away with love. And they hired a guy who probably had military background. The new coach lined the boys up against the wall and said, all right, I want everybody at attention. And the kids were all, you know, this kind of stuff. And two of them were up against the wall like this. He says, I don't need anyone to hold up the wall. Take two paces forward. Everyone, I want everyone standing at attention. And now as everybody was standing there, he says, I'm looking at a team of winners. Two guys burst out into laughter. <laughs> okay, you and you, the two laughers, you're off the squad. Huh? You thought it was funny that I'm looking at a team of winners? Out you go. Next season, you come back next school year, and I'll consider you on the team again. But, but, out. No, this isn't up for discussion. And as they were leaving, the rest of the guys, you just threw away our best players. Best players, you're in last place. Oh, so now he looked at him again. He says, I'm looking at a team of winners. And they all stood there. Now nobody dared laugh. What's a winner? <laughs> Somebody who wins and brings home the pennant will bring honor to the school as champions. Uh, we're in last place. Well, that's going to change starting today. These poor kids. This guy had to be from the Marines. He had them jog labs. We want to play baseball. <laughs> you know how side aches are when you're out of shape? Everybody was crying. Then after that, whoever complained, he made them run around town. Then after that, they had to play soccer. We're playing baseball. No, you're going to get into shape first. Because I'm looking at a team of winners. This is what makes champions. Gentlemen, your first and only thing you must ever remember is that first, you must believe. Believe what? <laughs> that you're champions, you're winners. Believe it first, and then you'll do it. Okay. No sé qué habla este hombre porque no le estoy entendiendo como que winners. <laughs> Mostly Latino kids. <laughs> they look like me. <laughs> without the mustache. And so, guess what happened? That season they came in fourth place. The next season they came in first place. The following season they won the regionals. The next season they won state champions. The next season they were number two in the nation. They went all the way to nationals. First, you must believe now, here's a picture of their dugout. I had to go there myself. I took these pictures, most of them. That is their dugout. What do, what do they see when they go into the dugout? First, 
You must believe. And it began to spread across the school. Other things began to happen as students said, well, if our team can be champions, we should put it on the schoolhouse as well. Notice they didn't bring in a professional sign painter. The sophomore class painted it first. You must believe. And they said, let's apply it to academics. And let's make it, uh, we can be champions in academics and champions in sports. That equals winners. And so look at this next picture. As the school advanced, first, you must believe. And their scores dramatically increased. Suddenly their 60% appalling dropout rate changed. And their scores increased as students began to say, I believe. I believe these folks don't even know who Jesus is, but they came to believe in something. We have men and women in uniform this very night whose lives are on the line for our country. They believe in something. Today, the President of the United States awarded the Medal of Honor to a living soldier who did far beyond the call of duty in Afghanistan. But he says, I must accept this with absolute humility and mixed feelings because two of my buddies that I pulled off that battlefield died that day. You see, they believe in something. And the whole town was impacted by the faith of these kids. And now when you go to Rosstown, Texas, the shame of having been the cotton pickers is now the pride and joy. You can see it from miles away. The Robstown Cotton Pickers. Now it's called Picker Pride. We won't take it any further than that. But they know what they're talking about. And those of you watching this program in Texas, you got it together. You're inspiring a lot of people because first you must believe. And look at them when they wear their uniforms. Look what's on the chest of their uniforms when they play today. First, you must believe. I had to go down there and see this for myself. And I'm telling you right now, Jesus wants to be your Savior. He wants to forgive you of your sins. But first... You must believe all things are possible to them that believe. If you don't want to believe, no wonder. Well, I'm not sure. Yes, you are. You're just afraid to believe in something. You can believe. Somebody once said eloquently, let go and let God. He can lead you. It's about faith. See, that's where the power of faith triumphs over the power of religion. Because you and I can argue about religion day in and day out and never agree on anything. But one thing you cannot argue with is faith. Because when God has blessed somebody, what you gonna do about it? Okay, I see, and I've seen some people, I am fascinated. I cannot explain what I'm seeing. I recognize it's a positive experience. <laughs> Believe. After the apostle spoke to a government leader once in the Bible, the government leader says, I believe. And he turned to God. Help thou my unbelief. I recognize I don't even know how to believe, but I want to start today. Teach me how to believe, O oh God. You see, it's very personal, isn't it? It's experiential. How can we learn to obey what God has commanded us unless we knew Him personally? I, I don't know about those two guys behind me, but every once in a while, somebody sees them. People believe. And they don't, and I've never talked about it publicly, so don't get any ideas. I'm just telling you, when you believe, all things are possible. I must, it begs the question again, does that mean you will be spared the injustices of life? No. Like Joseph of old was sold by his brothers as a slave. That is the worst calamity could have happened to him. A Canaanite slave in Egypt. And then he was purchased by Potiphar, the captain of the guard of Pharaoh, the king and the god of Egypt. And never had Pharaoh's household been so blessed. He was such a faithful servant that everything prospered. He became a millionaire, billionaire, one of the most powerful men in the Middle East, all because his slave, Joseph, loved God and was faithful. And so Sister Potiphar became confused about her needs and accused him falsely when he wouldn't cross the line because of the seventh 
commandment, thou shalt not bear, no, you, thou shalt not commit adultery. How could he now violate the trust of his master and mess with his woman and lack respect for another human being? And she accused him falsely and he was thrown into prison. Back in those days in Egypt, when you were put into jail, it was to be there for three days till they decide whether to hang you or let you go. Uh, seven years later, He's still there. There were no prison sentences in Egypt. Three days is what you got, and you're either dead or alive by the fourth day. And he's still there. And, and the Bible tells us that never had the water been cleaner, never had the food been so delicious, the prisoners enjoyed being there. He did the warden's work for him. That's a quote directly from the Bible. And finally, the, uh, one day, the, 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 the Pharaoh, the king, had nightmares. Now this poor kid was sold as a slave and now he's in prison. A Canaanite slave in prison with no hope of ever coming out. And suddenly the king, Pharaoh, has nightmares because Joseph had the gift of responding and interpreting dreams. He comes in before the king and tells him what was to come. And the king says, never have I seen such wisdom. Come in and be my prime minister. And so slave... Slave in prison to prime minister of Egypt. He was not spared the injustices of life, but wherever he was, no matter what happened, he knew who his God was. He was faithful to God. And when you are faithful, anything your hand touches will flourish. And he ended up prime minister of the greatest nation on earth at that time. You see, all things are possible when you believe so think about this ask yourself tonight those of you watching in this through stream or on television those of you here ask yourself in a society where god is not even second place god does not exist this is the post-christian era it is not the post-modern era post-modernism ended in 1979 we are now in the post-Christian era. Have you noticed? Folks have no need or desire for a Savior. And there are folks actually sitting in churches who know a lot of doctrine, but they don't know the author and finisher of our faith. They too are secular. They too are stuck. They don't have a Savior. So this is your moment. All things are possible to them that believe. For God so loved. For God so loved the world. For God so loved the world that He gave. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him for God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son that whoever believes in Him will not die. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son that whoever believes in Him will not die. They will live forever. That's a promise. Do you believe? Or is this just another matter of debate? Well, I find it fascinating it's called being a skeptic skeptical people take pride in the fact that it must be reproduced in a lab but when i have demonstrated to my friends in a lab through frontal lobe research as well this is what god does when he forgives sin he actually removes these chemical components from the frontal lobe of your brain so that you rest from that conscience that was destroying you and making you physically sick. There are physiological responses in our body when we come into contact with God Almighty. Well, I'm fascinated. I have to admit, I, it's beyond my understanding. See, when you're a skeptic, you're not going to believe anything even when you see the evidence. If you see the two guys behind me, well, I think I didn't get to bed late, early enough last night. The point is... Sooner or later, you must be confronted by the question, what do you believe in? Do you believe in anything? 
You can believe in your NFL team, but if they start losing six in a row, you're going to stop believing. Well, there's always next season. That's always the common term for those of us. I won't name my team, but last night was a bad night. Did you figure it out? Those of you watching, you don't know what I'm talking about, but this is good. In Brazil, you don't worry about our sports over here. Brothers and sisters, what do we believe in? Do you believe? I want to challenge you to believe in God. Jesus said, believe in God, believe in His prophets that He has sent. Because when Jesus cried overlooking Jerusalem, He says, Jerusalem, Jerusalem, you that stoned the prophets, you that have killed everybody I sent to you, how often have I wanted to hold you like a chicken holds her chicks under her wings? How often has God wanted to hold you close to His heart? And then He says, but you don't want it. How can He force us? What do you believe in? What do you believe in? I want to challenge you. The same two people, I'd like to invite you back. Those of you watching this program, you know you've been convicted. You sense the movement of the Holy Spirit right there in your house. Others of you, right here, you know, you know, your heart is telling you, you know this is true. The truth will set you free. That's a breakthrough for your life, that you too can have forgiveness of your sins. You too can meet God for yourself. You can know everything about Him without ever meeting Him. That tonight, you can know Him. Do you believe? All things are possible to them that believe. And with each succeeding meeting, we see God building His case that now that you become a disciple, disciple, then He teaches you all things whatsoever He's commanded you. So we are growing in grace with each one of these meetings. Has it made sense thus far? Is the Lord a reasonable God? Or is He just spouting religion at you? You see, this is reasonable stuff. Why not have forgiveness for our sins? Why not have wholeness in our lives? Why not have principles that we could take home and have better marriages and parenthoods with? It, you can believe. First, you must believe. If Robstown, Texas can get it together, so can Tacoma, Lakewood, Seattle, Puyallup. Where else? Come on now. Along the sound. Even the orcas can get excited watching you running around. You know that's the truth. I come out here, my poor sister's been here for what, 25 years? Her house is in old Tacoma overlooking the sound. The first day I came here a few years ago, I stood there and saw a pot of orcas. And I said, they're orcas. They didn't believe me. <laughs> we've been here since kingdom come, and we've never seen them out there. Unless we're on the boat and chasing them up, you know, further north in the sound. They came by when I arrived. <laughs> it was awesome. <laughs> Even orcas like me, see? So this is cool. No, I wasn't imagining them. I saw them. As I sing this song, if you want to say to the Lord, I believe. Even if you have to admit like that leader did, help thou my unbelief. You believe. Come on up here while I'm singing this song. And if there's another person here who says, I know the Lord's calling me to prepare for baptism. I know this now. I am certain of this. You come on up here as well as I sing this song for His glory. On a hill very far away stood an old rugged cross where the dearest suffered and died that I might live by his side. Oh, I'll cherish the old rugged cross in its trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown 
monte del Calvario estaba una cruz donde murió mi querido Jesús por salvar al más vil pecador so I'll cherish the old rugged cross in its trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown so I'll cherish the old rugged cross in its trophies at last I lay down I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it someday for a crown I will cling to the old rugged cross and exchange it for a crown. Amen. Amen. Glory. When the angels worship, they say, Hallelujah. Glory to the Lord. When they pronounce His name, the Lord God Almighty, they bow and they veil their faces with their wings in reverence. When a soul turns to God, the scriptures say there's rejoicing in heaven. The choir sings a note even higher than before. So what kind of sound would that be? I know when we get to heaven, he's going to hand out harps. I'm sure they're 12-string harps. <laughs> Imagine when we all get there and we all play guitars together. Now, that is heaven to me. <laughs> not, not, that's not to be insulting, but we all imagine. Because the Bible says, I has not seen, neither has ear heard, nor has it entered the imagination of people what God has prepared. It's going to be even better than that. Do you believe God bless you. Do you believe? Is there anybody else who says, I believe, Lord, help thou my unbelief. Come on up here. Come on up if the Lord's calling you. Come on up. You believe. Just come on up. I'm not appealing to your emotions. Let us reason together, saith the Lord. If your, skin, your sins are as scarlet. Because there are folks who say, but I'm not worthy to come up. That's when he wants you to come. Because he is worthy. And he wants to bless you. Come on up. As we conclude in prayer, come on up. Anyone else who needs to prepare for baptism, only you know who you are. I would love to invite you. God bless you. But I'm not the one to invite anybody. The, the Holy Spirit is inviting you. That's right. The Spirit of Almighty God. Come on up. As we conclude in prayer, as our heads are bowed in reverence and respect to God, while we are praying, Come on up, because the Lord has called you. Let's pray. Father in heaven, first, we do believe. Help thou our unbelief. Lord, as that serpent was raised up and healed all those people because they believed in you, as Jesus was raised up, you heal our lives and save us because we believe in him. Oh, Lord, pour out your blessing upon us right now. For some, this is the first time to cross this line, not of religion, but of faith. To take a step of faith, a personal step with God. 
And Lord, I think of all those who are watching this program on television or through the internet. You grab that, that phone book and call an Adventist pastor and tell them that the Lord has called you and you want to study the Scriptures. And Lord, just bless us beyond what we know how to ask. Please don't stay here. Go home with us. Live there, please. And so may this be the beginning of something because first we believed. In the name of Jesus, I pray. And all God's people said, Amen, amen and Amen.